to take over and start the session thank you so much ruchi uh as ruchi just mentioned uh, we now head towards the eighth session of the day 2 of the conference this one is titled personalizing the pandemic ethnography of the self and the other for this session we have four presenters but before i introduce them to you let me repeat the rules of the presentation each presenter will be allowed to read their paper for a total of 20 minutes after 15 minutes i'll indicate the 5 minute window for conclusion of the paper and once again 2 minutes before the time is up in case we overshoot the time for any presenter i request them to address the questions from the audience directly in the chat box So with that let me introduce you to the first speaker for the session uh, she's the second name in the schedule if you look at it this is zeba munir zeba is a phd scholar in dr k r narayan center for dalit and minority studies jamia millia islamia her paper is titled examining the space of mourning in covid 19 an auto ethnographic ethnographic study uh, over to you zeba Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, now I'm starting with my paper. One of the life's biggest challenges is learning to cope with the death of someone or something you love. The grief of loss can frequently seem unbearable. One might feel a range of challenging and unanticipated feelings, including astonishment, guilt, and intense sadness, as well as a shock of fury. The mourning pain can also interfere with your physical well-being. making it challenging to eat sleep or even think clearly we have been mourning our losses collectively since antiquity and the process of mourning rituals has always played a significant role in different cultures anthropologists have long been fascinated by the ways that many cultures create distinctive beliefs and rituals that provide meaning to mortality and its functions in human life according to delcaim rituals present at ceremonial assemblies are essential to social integration social interactions are based on moments of collective effervescence because they foster closer bonds among those who participate in them and provide people a chance to engage with something greater than them the value of rituals in contemporary society has not diminished in contrast ritualistic practices continue to be important not in spite but precisely because of growing societal disintegration generally in mourning rituals individuals gather together in an assembly to comfort one another and through a sense of collective trauma that helps in some ways to soothe the grief suffering and bring about closure the idea is to achieve catharsis which would allow us to release our suppressed feelings of sadness anguish and suffering through tears when people share their individual experiences of law loss they tend to make greater sense of the experience and gain high level of comfort and growth to move on in life as a meaningful purpose we need to find a proper closure to our losses that proper closure bereavement of our losses process of mourning disrupted completely during covid 19 times due to the lack of mourning rituals people experience a kind of unfinished mourning during the covid 19 pandemic a study examines that cultural rituals offer both integrative and regulatory aims by providing even a symbolic order providing a structure for the emotional chaos of mourning and assisting in the creation of shared meaning among members of the family community or even nation pandemic 20 has impacted almost every nation and corroded all aspects of human life we all have different kinds of experiences while living during pandemic time our lives were affected in a varieties of ways by the mandated nationwide lockdown this paper attempts to get a thorough knowledge of the experience of grieving through during covid 19 pandemic based on my own subjective experiences as a healthcare worker the stories of silent suffering the incomprehensible and insurmountable pain of departing from our loved ones without seeing them and the trauma it had brought some of it i witnessed on my own was heartbreaking i'll try my best to be honest about profoundly somber topic but it is always difficult to articulate and narrate a tragedy and trauma um i want to quote few lines from peter elwine trauma is not what happened to us but what we hold inside in the absence of an empathetic witness we were all on the same boat it's true but we brought with us our absurdity discrimination and prejudice all of which weighed down the boat and resulted in countless deaths around the world incorrect information related to coronavirus was spread through various platforms supported by mainstream media based on their own self propagated agendas so many people became expert coming out with their unsolicited onions 
to the masses making perturb people more anxious moreover our nation has a large number of uneducated people which made the job of the healthcare system more complicated and challenging as they themselves did not know about the virulence of this foreign virus virus and its malevolent impact on various systems of human anatomy and immunity this explains that why the death rate was not palliating despite best possible concerted efforts now i want to include uh, employ some of my subjective experiences in this chapter everyone has someone who died during covid 19 the character of symptomist smith and mrs dalloway created by virginia wolf is examined in a study to show how the traumatized individuals need to give meaning to their suffering to heal from the trauma the people affected by the loss of their loved ones are unable to find to the in fact we were preparing ourselves for the challenging task and fate that the government and humanity put in us on march 24 2020 when i was walking on the roads to the health center i was scared to see the deserted lanes and roads police and paramilitary personnel posted everywhere on the roads stopping people to come out in the open checking our i cards and the certificate that was issued by the health authorities a feeling of incomprehensible fear of the uncanny and willed me from all sides numbing all my sensations it defamiliarizes the familiar spaces familiar corners by lanes facade of the buildings and establishments that were usually open and full of life and activity a sudden thought disrupted my reverie how so much could have changed in just 24 hours there was no hustle bustle on the university campus no churning voices of rickshaw pullers no honking sounds of vehicle nothing it was an arduous and testing time to work under so much pressure and then the disruption of the supply chain of goods posed a different obstacle to procure life saving medicaments surgical goods and other logistics to get ourselves better prepared for any emergency situation it was extremely scary to work under the threat of deadly virus i somehow overcame the fear of working amidst this uh, condition and when you manage to overcome your fear you start to look beyond it and to see the things that you have not noticed before the grief brought on by the bereavement experiences and natural emotion that lasts for a while by accepting the received absence and lending liberty to others and eventually the individual moves through this state however covid 19 interfered with the typical grieving process making it harder for the bereaved to cope it created an aporia the brought on by the, the aporia that was uh, brought on by this deadly virus and the measures the government took to stop it from spreading people was uh, now i am telling you about the hospital's condition people were swarming like bees outside the hospital emergency room and the helpless cries and sobbing wails and very eyes filled with tears created a terribly gloomy atmosphere i saw a woman sobbing over her loss and unwilling to hug me out of concern about contamination the image of people silently crying under a tree gazing up at the sky pleading with god and casting frantic glances in the direction of the hospital emergency door they were all strangers to one another but their shared sense of agony brought them together in the open and they all appeared to be free of any trace of the corona virus as if anticipating death to arrive and claim them as well like their loved ones the life that was cut short the life that should have the opportunity to live longer the worth that person now has in the lives of others and the wound that forever changes those who continue on our debt what one laments although the pain of another person is not the same as one's own the loss that the stranger experiences cross over into the sorrow that one personally experiences potentially bringing together strangers in mourning the guard standing outside the mock in one of the hospitals told me that he lost count of the bodies which had been handed over to the families from the mock his eyes were red and teary and he was extremely exhausted both physically and emotionally he seemed to be stuck in a sisyphian act like ancient marina who was destined to tell his tale again and again their duties had extended for indefinite period due to the shortage of staff i learned about a family in jamia community whose wife tested positive for corona virus and her husband however did receive the negative result but had to spend the entire time alone in the house their two sons also tested tested positive but had only mild symptoms so they were taken to the quarantine center the woman passed away a week later in the hospital the individual who was left alone in the house refused to speak to anybody would not answer the calls when we tried to reach him 
And when we did manage to speak with him, he sounded so shattered and was unable to articulate him. He wanted to end his life and his entire existence had crumbled like a bird's nest in the middle of a violent storm. Millions of people were rendered emotionally numb by the loneliness and existential anguish that the coronavirus brought into their lives. The abrupt onslaught of the infection deeply traumatized them. The coronavirus claimed the patient in a clinical setting far from the family. The pain brought on by these deaths grew considerably harsher because family members were not present during the deceased final moments of life and they were unable to bid them favor. They will have to bear the weight of this loss forever. The guilt and regret lingered for a longer time, perhaps for a lifetime. The hospital authorities handled most of the dead bodies during the first wave in 2020. If they did give the bodies to the bereaved families, the COVID protocol it made it very difficult for the people to arrange a decent burial or cremation because gatherings were not permitted. They were mourning the loss to which they could not witness it through their own eyes. It was like a permanent black spot that got engraved in the chamber of the subconscious minds of the millions of people. Corporeality, an important aspect of handling green, was totally missing. A study examined that how in COVID memorials, tactility emerged as a means of remembering because it depicts the difficulty of individuals to touch during the pandemic and conveys the human urge for connection. The telling images of numerous fires blazing at a cremation site outside of the main city was featured in the Hindi newspaper, filling everyone's heart with my feet and dread. Cremations were being performed, start, performed starting at 4 a.m., according to a staff member who asked to remain unnamed. The employees at the cremation ground had been working until sunset every day, leaving them with no choice but to remain on the grounds at night. Massive destruction of human lives due to coronavirus made people numb to their losses. There was so much chaos and confusion surrounding us that it became impossible to make sense of our losses and to attribute meaning to our losses. That is why our wounds were left unattended and exposed with no embalming words of condolence. Death is a virtual reality. The human loss, suffering, destruction was present, present in the digitized world, making it a spectacle to watch and silently consumed only. The height of desperation was seen everywhere. COVID-19 knows no power, no social status, no riches, no ethnicity. It moved across spaces and times, carried everything with its unprecedented power. Death during Corona pandemic became a virtual reality. As it was not possible to let the people handle the dead bodies of the victims of coronavirus on their own with the fear of its highly contagious nature. Death was present everywhere with its absence, celebrating its success in devouring so many innocent lives. It created an aporia and impasse. We knew it was there, but we could not cross it. It was like a spectacle which we observed from a distance and consumed it as a virtual reality. It was akin to what Zizak mentioned in his essay, Welcome to the Desert of the Real, that how 9-11 tragedy failed to touch the heart of the people because of the absence of the actual dead bodies present. People could not connect it to the tragedy at human level, as the whole scene was repeatedly telecasted on the mainstream media, showing two airplanes crashing into twin towers of the WTC, followed by a huge dust storm. People consumed the actual tragedy as some distant and virtual event. Similarly, in COVID-19 times, the knowledge of the death of the loved ones were received only through digitized mode. And then hospital authorities, in the presence of minimum members of the bereaved family, carried out the final ritual. This perilous situation caused absence of closure, a sense of anxiety, created an ambivalence, inevitability, helplessness, isolation, hollowness, existential crisis, and cognitive numbness. The sudden absence of someone close to us created an incomprehensible ambiguity. It was like someone just not there who were there for a few days before and not having any knowledge and visual of what had happened in the ICU with him or her created permanent vacuum. We all were forced to consume the tactile reality as virtual reality and that had profoundly impacted our cognitive schema. Uh, understanding grief in COVID-19 times. Grief is a normal and healthy human response to loss that naturally and gradually heals while some emotional reactions are universal. Each person's grief is unique and may be experienced in a variety of ways. Grief with, with all its nuances may linger longer than most people anticipated or understand. The five dimensions that are affected during the grieving process are physical, emotional, psychological, social, and spiritual. In order to cope up with grief, we must express and share it with others. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, psychiatrist, introduced the five stages of grief, also called the DABDA model, and she created it by interviewing 200 individuals
that is denial denial involves more than just denial involves more than just rejecting the actual laws it may also seem hopeless and useless like the world has lost all its significance after a loss anger may become the most intense feeling we feel Ang anger after a loss can be misdirected and can be aimed against a range of people and places in our lives bargaining it is only normal to desire life to resume the way it was before a loss when a loss occurs statements like if only we could go back in time what if this ever happened are used as a coping mechanism depression depression is entirely centered on the present grief may be felt more intensely than before it may seem as through the melancholy thoughts to remain forever forever due to the permanence of death fifth acceptance it is the realization that a loved one is actually physically gone and that a new terrible reality now exists as a result in normal circumstances people go through either of these stages depending on their loss and their ability to deal with it but people have experienced a kind of ambiguous grief a grief that cannot be that could not be articulated that could not be cannot be classified into a stage or category that was extraordinary created cognitive blackness people were too shocked to talk about it during the pandemic in the absence of traditional mourning rites that were prohibited by the covid-19 guidelines such non bereavement traumatic Eva, you have 5 minutes left you have 5 minutes left to wrap up i'm finishing i'm finishing such non bereavement traumatic events and death of a close one resulted in complicated grief often associated with ptsd when you are continuously experiencing trauma getting over grieving can be very difficult healthcare professionals have also experienced grief in ways that were unique to their line of work they have been countless instances of illness and suffering they have called family members far too often to inform them that their loved one may pass away that they are not permitted to visit they may hold up a mobile for them to say goodbye it is expected of healthcare professionals to understand how to deal with grief more adeptly than others but the truth is that they themselves have been going through a lot dealt directly with the patients dying from covid-19 and its numerous complications words of comfort had lost their meaning making it impossible to comfort the affected persons we were trapped in a liminal space torn between telling the whole truth or a partial falsehood to the emotionally vulnerable and helpless people who only wanted us to save their loved ones conclusion now i'm concluding it many people are uncomfortable about how quickly the pandemic impacted their lives families of the deceased were left believe, feeling ambivalent and on the brink of liminality because of the precarious situation they were unable to deal with their loss and as a result could not find closure for their ambiguous grief which resulted in unresolved feeling while we may mourn each of these losses we lack the ritual or even the language to identify them as such the narrative recurrences we incorporate into covid 19 telling serve to both commemorate those who have passed on and serve as a stark reminder of the willful ignorance that many people choose to embrace some have already urged us to put the pandemic behind us and many people are willing to comply and for good cause but the most vulnerable people will continue to suffer the pandemic's consequences for years to come grief requires one to face the uncertainty of every moment of life people acquire the ability to anticipate and prepare for all probable consequences we will try our best to be better prepared to face any catastrophe in the future however no amount of preparation can prevent the inevitable or make the unknown known people will never forget the spring of 2020 and 2021 for ages so much has written articulated and said about pandemic uh, i will conclude with these words by sylvan kemins and rebi jack reamer and i really want to dedicate this piece of writings to all the people who died in covid 19 and their bereaved families at the blueness of the skies and in the warmth of the summer we remember them thank you so much thank you so much zeva that was a very interesting paper you have very nicely balanced the theoretical aspects the anecdotal details and the descriptive details uh, your paper talks about the difference in the cultures of mourning and how uh, you know because of an absence of an empathetic witness there has been a lot of trauma response uh, to the situation um my question for you uh, uh ziba is a is a one with regard to the ptsd and the trauma response that you were talking about since you talked about a, a distinction in the cultural uh, factors involved in how we mourn how uh, you know how differently we respond to these situations do you think uh, you know even as much as our responses to these situations were very diverse uh, 
somehow because of the digital platforms and because of the support groups that sort of mushroomed around this time, there was a, a feeling of collective loss and a collective mourning that sort of also, uh, you know, uh, uh, blurred the differences, the cultural differences that are there in mourning as the support groups sort of brought the strangers who, who started connecting on the lines of a shared sense of loss and a shared sense of yeah. bereavement. bereavement yeah. Yeah, I totally agree with you. I totally agree with digitized media played a very important role, but I think uh, what uh, we experienced uh, during COVID memorial ceremonies and all post COVID, okay, uh, they are deliberately creating even in those memorials that feeling of tactility, human touch, right? So that I think human touch is very important and the uh, uh, digitized media could not provide that even during COVID-19 times and post COVID-19, right? So I think that human touch is very necessary that those hugs, those uh, uh, warm hugs, those holding hands, you know? So they were trying to deliberately create such kind of memorial places where uh, they bring uh, in people together and where they make a memorial to uh, pictures of the people who have passed away and they touch the pictures, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. I think I've answered your question. Right, right, right. And thank you for mentioning both the scene and the unseen effects of COVID-19 because, yeah. you know, visibly we could, uh, we were constantly getting the number of deaths that were taking place in the country yeah. across the world. But there are also a lot of unseen effects, uh, the intangible effects, which are related to the mental health. And as you rightly said, there are going to be consequences for the years to come as people are going to subsequently respond to the grief that they are still, you know, uh, grappling with. Uh, so also we have with us uh, the repertoire who was missed in the beginning, Zena. Hi. Hi. <laughs> hi. Yeah, yeah. Zena. Also, uh, so, yeah, she's uh, called the department. Yeah. Please So very enriching uh, presentation, Zeva. Uh, thank you for this. And we have a question uh, from Tarika Prabhakar. So she writes, uh, uh, thanks for the paper, Zeva. Your reference to Septimus Smith was a reminder that some of the symptoms of how COVID uh, deaths uh, yeah. left a form of PTSD in their wake. Could you comment on this aspect of mourning slash inability to mourn? Inability to mourn. Mourn. Okay. Um, I think uh, Septimus Warren Smith is a, I think, literary character created that it, be, it, uh, it became immortal. You know, right, right. So it, it, he was the character uh, uh, who was the first uh, created by Virginia Woolf as a symptoms of PTSD, right? So uh, PTSD, post-traumatic stress syndrome. I don't understand the question, please. Uh, uh, she's asking, could you comment on this aspect of mourning or inability to mourn, the deaths that have left a form of PTSD in their wake? I think uh, people there are still dealing with PTSD in COVID-19, post-COVID-19 also, no? People are still dealing yeah. with it, no? right? And yeah. uh, we, uh, I think uh, uh, it will take some more time uh, uh, and uh, more, uh, more support groups and more um, uh, more efforts from the societies uh, will be required to, uh, to help people deal, uh, to come out of that PTSD and to move towards uh, post-traumatic growth, right? So that's all. Yeah, thank you. So we have another question, and if we have time, uh, so this question is uh, by Fe is from Fezan. Uh, interesting presentation, Zeba. Uh, my question is uh, first: You said that depression is centered on the present. If yes, then can nostalgia be a form of depression in some cases? Uh, second. How would you differentiate between a journalistic uh, writing in a first-person narrative and autoethnography as a methodology of study? So what is the first? What was the first part of the question? That yeah, it's uh, uh, it is. Uh, you said that depression is centered on the present. If yes, then yeah. can nostalgia be a form of depression in some cases? Yeah, in some cases, it can be a form of uh, depression, nostalgia. No? Sometimes it's created nostalgia uh, and sometimes uh, euphoria for a certain condition creating a kind of depression right 
and second was no second part was uh, how would you differentiate between uh, journalistic writing in a first person narrative and auto ethnography as a methodology of study journalist writing i think is a very detached and clinical report right it has no emotional connection uh, 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 in journalist writing there is no emotional connect between the story and the storyteller but here in auto ethnographic studies it's kind of uh, um, uh, emotional experience a subjective experience subjectivity is uh, been celebrated here right so that is a difference i think there is more uh, uh, journalist is more clinical in nature right it's a more detached narration and auto ethnographic is not a detached narration uh, the person who is telling the story is also uh, within the story experiencing the tragedy and trauma right it's more emotional i think Okay. Thank uh, you. Suman, uh, do we have time for one more question? Okay. Uh, you are uh, muted. Sorry. Uh, you could please post it in the chat box and yeah, then. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Huh? okay. Right. Thank you so much. Uh, right. So we'll move on to the next presenter. Here we have Shadavanis. Shadav is a PhD scholar at the National Institute of Educational Planning and Administration, Delhi. His paper is titled Life and Death, a Narrative of Mourning and Struggle for Justice in Pandemic. Shadav, welcome to the conference. Thank you. Am I audible? Yes, yes, you are. Okay, so uh, thank you for this opportunity. I really thank Jeeva Munib's paper because my paper is basically autoethnographic and personal narrative. Which lacks uh, theoretical. Though I tried, I thought that I will give some theoretical aspect to that, but because of certain reasons, I could not do that. So it is basically my own journey. So I lost my mom in fourth of May in 2021, and uh, she died in front of emergency ward at IGIMS Patna in my arms. So when we were trying to shift her from uh, ambulance to uh, to the ward uh, in between uh, ambulance and the stretcher she took her last breath so this is this is uh, uh, how she died so what how uh, it is not easy for me to present uh, this this is very emotional part but i will try to uh, connect that i am always in a contradiction with what happens uh, uh, with the life uh, when a life being who is smiling, walking, uh, doing every normal thing and suddenly becomes a cold flesh with a sheet, so a diet. Where the all emotions go that we have so much emotions in a human body and suddenly all the emotions has gone. What happens after death? Is there, a, is there life after death? And when I recall that Siddhartha who later became, uh, become Gautam Buddha, the enlightened soul after seeing the sufferings and pain of fellow human beings, why he was so emotionally and psychologically triggered after seeing a dead, dead man that he left all his aristocratic privilege to understand the cause of pain and suffering. I am not Buddha, but Buddha himself says that everyone can become Buddha after awakening their mind and soul. Every human being is trying to find the way to overcome pain and suffering. In the process to introspect my feeling of loss, pain, emotional depravity, I joined a Vipassana 10-day meditation uh, in Jaipur, Vipassana is a kind of meditation in which a person tries to concentrate his breath and body without interacting with any other human being. It is believed Buddha got enlightened with the same meditation. However, can every human being have the much energy to sit and meditate to know the cause of pain? I don't know the answer, but question is why I needed Vipassana. The answer I already told. And I have a, a chronic... Uh, mental illness for more than 17 years and uh, it further this situation further escalated my mental health condition so what has happened so after the death uh, i tried to uh, 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 get a death certificate from the hospital because my mother's registered slip was already issued by the igms patna and uh, the moment after one hour when i tried to control myself and I went to the registration desk to please issue the death certificate. So the doctor on duty responses that uh, we are not going to give you any death certificate. 
और ज्यादा बहस करोगे तो बॉडी उठा के फेंक देंगे और वो सर जाएगा कोई कुछ नहीं करेगा पेंडेमिक के टाइम में हमें कोई फर्क नहीं पड़ता और वो आवाज लगाता है कि कोई आओ बॉडी को उठा के बाहर फेंको वार्ड से सो दिस वॉज दिचुएशन आई मंट आई कंटिन्यूसली कन्विंस ट्राई की बिकॉज माई मदर वॉज एन आंगनबाड़ी सेविका शी वॉज वॉकिंग सो आई नीड द डेथ सर्टिफिकेट बिकॉज ऑफ द मेनी अदर पर्पज बट आई वॉज डिनाइड then i thought it's, uh, it's, it it will go in vain if i continuously uh, uh, ask them so i took my mother back to my hometown district which is 120 km away from patna so what has happened there uh, and then i will go big back to uh, back uh, to the uh, to the whole incident my mother was admitted to a covid dedicated center sitamari uh, on 2nd of may 2021 and after that i i was not in home all the other members of my siblings my uh, uh, my father was covid positive i reached my hometown 3rd of september i was staying in a hotel and i was mostly uh, outside the covid dedicated center which was lacking all the basic facilities there was no except paracetamol there was no uh, medicines the oxygen was there there was no uh, a way to how to know about your patients and patients were given mobile so you can con- con- contact them many a times i used to call my mother and she was not able to speak because she was already having a, a breath- breathing issues on 4th of may i got a call uh, from a, a host- uh, covid dedicated center that her oxygen saturation has reduced to uh, less than 60 she needs ventilation ventilator so we have to arrange an ambulance and take her wherever you want to take so we we finally we got an ambulance and when i reached with the ambulance at the covid dedicated center i was asked to enter the covid ward uh, no nurse and doctors were were ready to take her out and i was asked suddenly i was not having any ppt just mask and i don't have i didn't have any choice but i entered the covid ward there was the covid was full of the patients and my mother was walking and she was so weak that she was supposed to uh a fall so i i i, I hold her and i uh, bring, brought her outside and till all the time and then uh, I, i took another 15 minutes to settle her in the ambulance and for almost 20 minutes she was without oxygen so if the oxygen saturation is 60 60 uh, and then you can see the for the patient who is more than 15 20 minutes without oxygen so what her situation will be i asked the uh, on duty nurse please help me to settle down she said that i am not wearing the gloves so this was how things have started i said okay finally i have settled I, 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 we went there and we reached patna ems at 6 uh, evening so patna ems uh, politely said we don't have any beds you kindly take her to nmch in between i got a, a call from my close friend that there is the one bed ventilator is available in a private hospital i went there and there was a bed available but they have denied because the saturation was low and my mother's age was 50 so the most chances were that she may might be might she may win she may, she will lose her life so they denied the hospital uh, uh, the bed again i went to nmch which was a totally covid dedicated hospital the moment i went to the hospital i went to the registration counter i took a, a registration a slip i went to the covid center and i showed the uh, referral report of the covid dedicated center sitamadi so they were asking where is the positive report i said according to the rule uh, if anybody who is who is um, admitted to covid dedicated center it means she is positive so they were constantly asking no you don't have the covid positive report how how can i uh, uh, rely on that i am saying this is the referral report of the government covid center so in between 10 minutes was lost she was sent to the uh, covid uh, for, uh, again for a covid test and the covid test was negative at that point of time so the covid center is here the covid registration center is there covid uh, uh, test center is there so in between you have to run around there again it, it, uh, i have lost almost 20 30 minutes and then they said ki yeah, we won't admit her in the covid ward because her report is negative so i went her, i then someone has called me that igim is go to igim is today only this hospital has been converted in a covid ward covid hospital and they are not requiring any positive report 
so i took her to igms i reached there at 10 pm and uh, in between i got the covid positive report the pdf so i the moment i entered the covid ward emergency i saw the three beds were there there was no patient so i rushed to the doctor and the doctor saying what is the oxygen saturation i said it is right now it is at t2 the doctor saying we won't admit her because we have a policy that whose oxygen is below 90 Uh, without oxygen then only we will accept her oxygen saturation is 82 with oxygen then we won't accept we won't admit her and i said ki then what is the uh, point of creating this covid emergency ward he saying bahas mat karo hum isko admit nahi karenge chahe tumko jo karna hai kar lo and then doctor bola bol raha my duty has changed over i am going and for from 10:15 he leaves and then another doctor joins at 10:30 so you can imagine the 4th of may which was the so high pandemic covid cases and the emergency ward part of the capital was without any doctor at 10:30 your doctor joins i requested again he said okay go and get a registration slip he was without ppe kit he, and then he again takes 15 minutes to wear the ppe kit he was using mobile phones and everything he was just walking he was very normal it seems that uh, the nothing has happening and I, i was continuously running to my mother to the doctor to my mother to the doctor and when he says in 10 11 10 55 pm go and bring your mother so i was trying to shift her and she took her last breath so after that uh, this is the ho- whole incident that has happened and then and then this the whole that body utha ke phek denge that certificate was not not issued i took her back and in the morning i reached patna and again what has happened that we were not allowed to cremate in a one cremation ground but the people were asking are you a muslim uh, uh, tumne nahaya kyun nahi hai tumhari family naha ke kyun nahi aayi hai ambulance mein kyun leke aaye ho unko nahi laaya kyun nahi hai so we were we were saying ki situation is not that we we could take her in a home and how we will manage everything because all the family members are covid positive so somehow in the second cremation ground we were allowed to do that and then when the jeba was talking about this uh, 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 last rites and so did, she did not get the proper respectful last, last right and after that and 7th of may i thought i said i won't let it go and i wrote to i wrote around 150 mails to the people because i have a privilege to be part of the universities of bhu du jnu where i know the people i started writing them and then uh, uh, in between i got a connection of the human rights law network i said i will file a petition whatever the outcome will be i will fight for that and i also then i i got a call from a igims director and he said what is the what proof you have that your mother was brought to igims patna so the director of a hospital is saying like that you what you have to pr- pr- produce the proof that your mother was brought here i said i have a sufficient amount of proof my ambulance was there i everything i i, I can pro- uh, i confidently said that i can prove that so he said okay come to the come to my hospital and get the certificate i went there in the pandemic after 15 days and the doc uh, on the chief medical officer says ki okay we will give you the certificate that your mother was brought dead we won't accept that your mother died in the hospital only i said i and he said you have to uh, give in the written that you don't have any complaint against the hospital then only we will issue the uh, death certificate i said i won't give any writing and then after that i filed a writ petition in the patna high court the the writ petition has been disposed of the the uh, court has appointed a committee a three member committee i read all the eight page report and it seems that they have just set uh, in uh, for the formality and to, uh, in uh, toto as means they supported the state argument that there was no medical negligence that any general of the of the state of the bihar, bihar state says that the petitioner has already stated that he has medical condition and he has over overhyped the case the second point he said the petitioner came to know that the covid patient is going to get a Uh, 4 lakh rupees excretia amount that is why he is going to struggle that the fact is that the covid uh, 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 compensation amount, amount 
get, getting COVID compensation was a very easy choice for me. I could have said that my mother died in the Sitamari only. I could have got a death certificate from Anganwari Center because my mother was an Anganwari worker. So I know she used to uh, issue death and birth certificate to the people. And I could have easily get that four lakh rupees. So these were the, and the NMCH submits that the patient, the petitioner did not produce the positive COVID positive report, and they are totally uh, ignoring the fact that I have produced the referral report. So when one person is uh, referred from one hospital to the another, the referral report is important. Not the, the whether you have the positive report or the, de the negative report. And this was the argument uh, by, uh, saying by the attorney general of the Bihar state uh, for the expiration amount for overhyping the situation he has filed the writ petition he has some grudges against medical fraternity and the state and meanwhile the the Patna High Court has said that uh, uh, it needs further inquiry whether the medical negligence happened or not so you have to fi file a presentation to the principal secretary when I was writing this paper in between, I got a letter from a principal secretary of the health department Bihar, the 13th of this month, there will be a hearing. So on a very short notice, I was not able to attend that my lawyer was there. And he was thrashed, the principal secretary thrashed by lawyer by saying, Ki, you, are, you, are, you have cooked whole, the whole story. There's nothing to, to lie in, the, in this whole petition that your, your client is non traceable and you have demanded a one crore rupees of compensation. What kind of, you, you didn't come to me, you went to the uh, uh, court. The fact is that on the 7th of May, I have started writing to all the authorities, from the chief ministers, the governor, to the principal secretary, to the district CMO of Sita Maria and Patna. Everyone, no one responded. I only got a response and that. Shut up, you have around five minutes left. Yes, yes, I'm going to complete that. In between, this was the things that happened and in between there was someone was talking about post-traumatic stress disorder. I have gone through that. I took a etilampro, which is a tablet. I had a pain, chest pain around that. And for the first time in my life, that one hour memory is completely lost in August. What has happened in one hour, it was completely lost. I I am I'm still not able to regain that. I contact, contacted the doctor because I was already in you know, a psychiatric medicine. The doctor says that it is a high where you are you are having a very high uh, intensity of post traumatic stress disorder so this was the how things have happened uh, i don't know still even after uh, from 2020 and 4th till that i haven't got the death certificate which is the 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 birth and death register says that the death certificate will be issued on the day of the death with the cause what is the cause so i will conclude by saying uh, a woman who used to use but her death certificate to the people, their, their family members are still suffering to that. I personally do not have any grudges against the health fraternity. I have seen some of the good doctors in my life. But I will all, well, I will not accept the fact that the people, the, the everyone is saying this is the, this was a pandemic and people have lost their life because of the pandemic. I will say that people have lost, lost their life because of the health uh, apathy to, to, to their children. Being as a citizen of this country, I have all right to raise the questions, and I am not going to give up. And the trauma is, and the pain is suffering. There is no closure, but I still the fight will go on. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shadab. Uh, we're very sorry for your loss, and as a part of Jamia and uh, on behalf of the YRC team. I extend my condolences to you. Uh, if it's okay with you, uh, shall we pose a few questions? Yes, yes, yeah? of course. All right, right. And if you believe that you know, you're know you not comfortable answering a particular question, please feel free to let us know. Uh, you know, I was, I was really, uh, you know, I, I would totally agree with what you were talking about in terms of, you know, how the plight of COVID victims is more because of the medical negligence and the deliberate uh, refusal to provide medical support, uh, which, you know, gets intensified because uh, with the intersect, uh, when it's intersected with racial slurs. 
as you talked about your personal experience and, and the kind of uh, racial slurs that uh, were directed towards you and, and, and your family. And you know, it, it, I completely agree with you where you said that it actually exceeds the physical impact of the disease as well. And uh, you know, when you were talking about uh, running from one medical hospital to uh, from one medical place to another medical aid, um, and and you know, uh, you know, the whole uh, discussion with the lawyers and the legal system, I was wondering, you know, how much the knowledge of the medical and the legal jargon is important to be able to also fight that system to be also to be able to negotiate uh, for you know what's rights and um, in continuation with that uh, you know i was just looking up on uh, you know while going through your abstract i was going uh, i was looking up on the increase in medical health insurance policies in companies in india in the past few years and um, a, a study says that around 10 to 15% uh, medical health insurance policies have increased. Uh, uh, I mean, sorry, the premium has increased by 10 to 15% and around 16.5% policies increased in 2021 and 31% policies increased in 2022. So my second question is, uh, you know, with regard to how, because you also mentioned that, you know, you spoke with people from different corners of your world, DU and, and Delhi and, and back there in Patna, so I was wondering, how does this, uh, how does this idea of connections and uh, financial aid help in uh, fighting the battle against what we see is a, clearly a nexus between hospitals, medical health insurance policies, and the state negligence also to some extent? So it's a two-pronged question, if you're comfortable answering that, please. Yeah, uh, the first thing that the, the moment I started writing to the people, so I was totally clueless. I had some exposure to the activism when I was in Delhi University, but I didn't know how to file this legal battle. So I started writing. I was just so that I, I was writing anything, whatever I was, it was coming, I was just writing to the mail. So, but the moment then later on, the people started responding. And I got the so much response from a very well-known uh, activist, in India and the world, one of the respondent from the United Nations responded, and she she responded so well that the principal secretary of the Bihar has to uh, to ask the uh, the health system, department that why you are not issuing the death certificate. So I got a very a strong connection because there was no physical uh, uh, connection with the people. So we were isolated. And we didn't get a time to mourn, but through that, I would continuously ever getting a call from the different different activists, different people, politicians as well. And so I was get a, so I got a stand, but yes, yes, it is that I have a, some, but but I am wondering that I had a privilege, so I can connect with these people. If you are in a in a university, you have a space where you can connect. But what about the people? They don't. Know. I was totally unaware about this. How I have sat one. Th almost one month to prepare the report. The lawyers have said that you have gone through it. You have a, uh, are an educated person. You go through the reports and you give up summary of that. And then we will file the repetition petition of that. And the second, uh, so yeah, definitely the fraternity, the, 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 the support is, is very, very essential in, in, in the legal or any kind of battle on the ground. It is very, and I got empowered by that only. And still I got, one of the professors in GNU responded and she said that uh, the death is a very, uh, sorry, justice is a very rare public good. And access to justice is, is even more harder. I still record this, this just one line, this justice is a very rare public good. But it has a very, very strong in-depth understanding the why she is saying that. And when we are questioning the health or insurance or whatever it is, but ultimately it has come to the state. When we are talking about the, the then Nicholas Polan just talks about the relative autonomy of the state, where the state gets the second position is the, is the market. If you are talking about health and insurance, it is everything is market. It's all about profit. It's all it's all about the private hospital denied admission because because it was not that we were not going to give money. It was their reputation will be if she dies, a patient one patient will be added in their name that a patient is died in that. So it is the next. The question also important comes to the that one of the important one of the uh, uh, well-known activists 
wrote to me it is not about uh, that that you are questioning the health system it is the someone has to take accountability and a state is one of the important part of that definitely there is, is a very strong nexus between all this this intersect uh, each other but the question remains that who is accountable if i uh, being as a citizen has to ask that who is responsible for mother's death whether it is a pandemic if pandemic that why certain things have not taken care so health is just a one part layer of it but ultimately it come to the state a state like that yeah right thank you so much shadab uh, zera please take over yeah uh, firstly uh, shadab i am really sorry that you lost your mother to covid and secondly thank you for articulating what almost everyone went through at the height of the pandemic the feeling of being uh, helpless running from hospital to hospital and the jugaad of getting a positive report so uh, this is more of an observation uh, your paper reminded me of the time uh, during the uh, covid period when courts were closed for a certain number of days and uh, later on when zoom calls became a thing the courts also adopted them and justice was being served over zoom i was thinking aloud you know what it meant for the idea of justice to be rendered through a digital screen and did it uh, become similar to courtroom reality shows in that sense this is more of an observation so if you would like to uh, answer it it's fine uh, yeah i i i was not called uh, for uh, any hearing because in civil rights petition the petitioner's statement is important so mostly he was not called for the any uh my petition was filed through online it was going online and the hearing started when the court was open but i don't know uh, how but recently there are n number of videos even recently i was seeing that the constitution bench of supreme court was was live matlab so things were happening but i think it's an important so aspect that the things were going digitally because i could have not filed if the things were not happening digitally so yeah but i am not uh, so much equipped to answer in a very good manner so. it's totally fine thank you so much shada and thank you for sharing a very very personal detail of your life uh so now we would like to go on to the third presenter for today that this is devika sharma hi devika are you here uh, Hi, hi. Devika is a PhD scholar in Dr. K. R. Narayan Center for Dalit and Minority Studies, Jamia Millia Islamia. Her paper is titled "An Impressionist Tale: A Day of Field Work in the Pandemic." What do you, Devika? Uh, thank you, Suman. Um, let me not uh, switch on my camera. I want to be with Shadab, uh, my last previous presenter. Um, and let me just begin my <clears throat> paper. uh so the as suman mentioned the title is an impressionist tale a day of field work in the pandemic uh so the protagonist rangnar in sri lal shukla's rag darbari in conversation with the truck driver laughingly compares his current engagement which is research with digging up grass ghas khod raha hu ise angrezi mein research kehte hain uh, i would like to focus in this paper on that mundane and tedious task of ghas khodna or field work especially in the time of pandemic the paper has two major sections the first section attempts to elaborate what entails impressionist tale um in this section i also contextualize the tale which i will be you know uh, talking about uh, in the second part uh, so in this section i also contextualize the tale along with i discuss my positionality with specific emphasis on my ethnographic training the second section is the tale woven of a day's field work which is ordinary and unhappening suddenly things change there is a surge of activities participants show up and make me the audience to their conversation and um, some of their realities all this is circumscribed by the looming covid dread protocol which is not once spoken about but is palpable uh, its palpable presence is marked performatively i conclude with some reflections on doing field work during the pandemic and the need to reimagine newer ways of writing ethnographies therefore probably newer questions um would be you know asked 
uh, working in the field with my people, as it were, as well as constructing it in the absence of them in my seclusion at home, is central to thinking about my fieldwork. Gupta and Ferguson, uh, Ferguson remind us that what it entails to be a good field worker is the ability to construct a good field. So instead of considering field as a bounded physical geographic space, the cultural arrangement of a group of people inhabiting that space can be observed. I'm thinking along with those who consider field also as a construct, which a field worker constructs a fiction as it were. James Clifford calls Bronis Malin Malinowski's diary in the true sense, uh, fiction of self, whereas his ethnography, Malinowski's ethnography, which is called Argonauts of the West Pacific, fiction of a culture. <clears throat> Uh, let me first try to give a little context to the fieldwork, which I'm engaged with. The fieldwork is part of PhD, uh, where I'm doing an ethnography on reading in a community library, which is located in a neighborhood that is on the margins adjoining several posh localities in South Delhi. The members in the library are largely children and youth from the neighborhood who live on rent in one or two room units, depending on the size of the family and family income. The the other bigger constituent in the library membership is shared by children and youth refugees of Pakistan. The research that I have undertaken is an attempt to understand development of readerly identities and what reading means to children and youth who visit the library. Uh, before I begin to present my tale, I also want to discuss the researcher's positionality by referring to Pierre Bourdieu's idea of participant objectivation, where he argues that it is not only her social origins, her position and trajectory in social space, her social and religious memberships and beliefs, gender, age, nationality, etc., but also and most importantly, her particular position within the microcosm of anthropologists. So I'm also wanting to place myself within the discipline of anthropology. And this is where I would like to draw attention to my position within the discipline of anthropology, more specifically in the field of ethnography in education. And uh, let me confess, I have not been trained in ethnography except for taking a semester long course on online mode. Uh, John Van Manen writes about his lack of training and apprenticeship as uh, he writes, without mentors or cohorts, our appreciation and understanding of ethnography comes like a mist that creeps slowly over us while in the library and lingers with us while in the field. Um, let me now talk about what does this tale mean? Uh, so I heavily draw on John Van Manen, uh, and he says that uh, tales, uh, you know, uh, he tries to say that tales uh, draw attention to the inherent story-like character of fieldwork accounts, as well as to the inevitable choices made by an author when composing an ethnographic work. So according to him, the impressionist tale is a representation means of cracking open the culture and the field workers way of knowing it so that, so that both can be jointly examined. Impressionist writing tries to keep both subject and object in constant view. Impressionist tale is derived from impressionist painting. Uh, like the impressionist painting captures a worldly scene in a special moment or a moment of time, the impressionist tale also recreates ordinary scene, yet it should not be an everyday occurrence. The work is figurative, but conveys a highly personalized perspective. It has to have drama. Just in paintings, drama is created by color, form, strokes, hatching, frame. The tale has characters, including the ethnographer herself, speaking in their voices. Some dramatic event is included, jokes, exaggerations. So the focus of the tale is in the doing of fieldwork and not done. So it is written in the present tense. Cultural knowledge is slipped to an audience in fragmented, disjointed ways. So the tale in the presentation is an account of a day of fieldwork in the third week of July, 2021. Um, the library had uh, reopened on July 4 after three months of break as a consequence of the second wave of COVID-19 that hit India in the month of March, 2021. Uh, now I'll go into the tale itself. <clears throat> So I reach the library, wash hands, go through the safety protocol, sanitize my hands on entering into the library. My temperature is checked, normal, greet some familiar faces. I do not know how the day would pan out, nor do I have any design that I have chalked out for the day. 
I don't quite know most of the times what to do, where to be and how to be. I'm most of the times just trying to understand what the participants are doing and where should I have located myself to better understand the activity or initiate a conversation. As I begin to re reach and settle in the place, I remember I had brought some everyday consumables to contribute to the library. I take them out and keep them behind my bag. I want to give those things directly to Shefali, who's the you know, volunteer librarian there, but she's attending to several library members at the circulation desk. A little later, when she has finished issuing books, I take the polythene bag, go and give it to Shefali. She's surprised and happy receiving it. Oh, ye to bohot zyada hai. As she's going out to the kitchen, she says, oh, isse yaad aya meri chai. I think she'll bring a cup of tea for me on return, but she doesn't, and I quickly forget about it. I'm not disappointed. I'm still an alien to them. I go back to table one where there is a new volunteer sitting and working on books. Earlier, when I had come to keep my things in this section, I had gone to table three and table four, where I had sat in the last two visits, but today the two tables are occupied by books and volunteers. Nigar is sitting opposite Aparna, and in between the two are stacks of books on a chair. I wish they call me and I'm privy to their conversation as they work, but the necessary physical distance would not be maintained. So I decide with a heavy heart to place my stuff at table one, where there was just one person, an unfamiliar face sitting. I think to myself that they will just end up observing from afar without any real conversations or learning anything new. But how long can it go on like this, I lament. But soon I get to work, observing, noting down, and thinking which questions can be probed, who can be approached, etc. I find that at smaller circulation desk, Karthik and Varun, a new volunteer, are sitting. Whereas on the other circulation desk, Shefali along with Karuna and Masum and Afghan volunteer are working. Um, after a gap of two hours of observing from a distance, I sense something about I sense something about to happen. I can see Shefali, Vinay, and Srishti stand almost 20 steps from me near the circulation desk. Due to the distance and masks and fans. I can barely hear them. She points towards the table where I'm sitting. It is vacant. Soon they both come in. Uh, soon they both come with Karuna, a student, student leader at the table, which I have occupied since the time I came in the morning. They all take their seats in front of me without being invited, just by being present. I get invited to become witness to the scene of the interview. I'm super excited. The field is opening up suddenly, I tell myself. Karuna po positions her chair opposite to Srishti's and Vinay's chair. Srishti's notebook is in her lap. She sits a bit away from the table. Vinay sits in between Srishti and Karuna. Vinay keeps the phone recorder on the table. I ask if I can keep my recorder too. Vinay has reservations. I tell him it's okay. I'll listen and write. They may, they may share the recording with me later if they're comfortable. Vinay is still not very sure about it as he says he will have to take permissions. I'm just excited about this interview. So I say it's okay. I get to know that this interview with Karuna is part of the series to reach out to their old patrons, as well as inviting new ones into the library by putting up videos of student leaders' experiences of being part of the library over the years on their various social media platforms. Karuna is the first in the list. Karuna is elated and a bit shocked. Record, record bhi karoge. Srishti begins asking and Karuna is ready with responses. Karuna shares that she joined TCLP seven years back when she was around 13 years old, but she's still in grade 11. This information does not seem quite clear, does not fit. And did I hear it right? She's speaking, so I, so I do not think too much about it. She joined the student council three years back. Uh, she hinted at some problems that happened two years back because of which her visits to the library were rather irregular. It doesn't seem clear to me what she said. What was the event that led to such consequences or what exactly was the consequence? Did she have to leave the student council? Did she stop coming to the library on her own or was she stopped from coming? Or the library staff stopped her visits to the library. Soon after, due to the log lockdown imposed by the pandemic, she could not participate in library activities but she mentions that she participated in the first English fluency program launched after the first wave of COVID-19 in between the partial lockdown. The library provided her a smartphone in March, 2021. And even after it got over, 
the, uh, the program got over, she has the device through which she connects to the library program. Karuna aspires to be a writer and she says that she knows it is only through the library that her dream can come true. Librarian banne ka interest aya, writer banongi, likhne ke liye zyada se zyada padna hoga, ye to library se hi hoga. Library acha hai, jo kitab chahiye kehte the, wo le aate the. Maine kaha tha English dictionary chahiye to dictionary le aaye. Library at their school and this particular library, she said, was very different. School mein jhanjat tha, koi kitab chahiye to monitor laake degi, jo prehna padta tha. Srishti added, Srishti is the volunteer who is actually asking the questions to Karuna. So Srishti added that in their li school library as well, they had to stay silent. Karuna interrupts smilingly and says, silence to yaha bhi hona hota hai, par hum hote nahi hai. Uh, after a few more responses, the interview concludes. My body is tensed. I'm excited. And then I'm also thinking, what next? Uh, Vinay does not leave as yet, so I begin a conversation with him. Uh, Vinay is another volunteer, uh, and he's volunteering as media uh, advisor in the organization. Uh, Vinay and I begin talking. A little later, Karuna comes close to us and teases Vinay. Oh, so ab, aapka interview chal raha hai. She asks if she can join. Vinay nods. Ajao. I feel extremely uncomfortable. There will be noise and the three of us will not be um, you know, giving enough uh, space. So uh, Shefali may not appreciate it. Shefali is the volunteer and uh, librarian. So she is the, in position of authority. So, the, <clears throat> so she may not appreciate it. The extreme replication might be that I'm told to leave the library forever. As Karuna walks around me to occupy the vacant chair left by Srishti, I tell her that it may not be allowed and we may be admonished for it. Daant par sakti hai. She leaves. I'm not so much scared of COVID, I feel, but of not getting an opportunity to stay on and complete my field work. I'm sad. I know I foreclosed a vital conversation. More importantly, I had upset one of my possible key participants. Vinay and I continue talking. After some time, he takes my leave. Um, so I, I, you know, I cut short this conversation. Um, so the day is coming to an end. And as I'm picking up my bag, Shifali goes out of the door saying, um, Shifali goes out of the door saying, ma'am, aapke liye samosa hai. I hear it, but I do not know if it is meant for me. She doesn't look at me. I couldn't see her seeing me and talking to me. If I stay and it is not meant for me, that samosa is not meant for me, then it will be socially very awkward and I would not want to eat someone else's share. If I do not stay, even after hearing her invite, I would disrespect her. I remember jokes and food are two things that suggest whether the field worker is accepted or not in the field. I'm in a dilemma. Should I perform the role of a field worker and accept invitation extended to me in the hope that it would open up many more opportunities and possibilities of field work? Or should I think ethically of food, especially in the times of pandemic? I decide to leave as my name was not mentioned. Five minutes, okay, yeah. Yeah, I'll finish. Uh, Shefali did not pause, look at me and invite. So was it even an invitation, I wonder? I say to myself, nobody would mind an extra samosa. But being a samosa short would hurt the person who for some reason decides to eat last. I'm also aware that the library runs on shoestring budget. So spending money on me may not be a good idea, I feel. So I choose to step out of the library quietly. Conclusion. Through the presentation of field work, that day's field work, I have tried to reflect on three different aspects of field work. Firstly, field work is a sort of rite of passage into the academic world. I would like to wonder what is the social being that emerges out of this practice of field work. As I'm learning in the field and field work seems to get interrupted again and again, and I have to reestablish my identity relationship with my people as it were, I learned the importance of waiting. Waiting seems to become the researcher's being. I'm reminded of Herman Hesse's Siddharth, where waiting is a human value that Siddharth learns through struggles over passage of time. Will I learn? How long will it take for academic project of PhD that I've undertaken is governed by regiments of time and economics. Secondly, the intersection of ethnographic distance and physical distance induced by COVID protocols produces bodies which are conscious of boundaries, which are not always verbally and in written voiced. 
it produces more hesitations and confusions. Lastly, unlike vignettes, which serve to form analytic categories and support our arguments in ethnography, an impressionist tale does not claim to do such function. This genre is written, told, and retold, and with every retelling, something newer insights, which you knew about, becomes known. The tale is told precisely for its sake. My politics of talking about a genre of tale which are on the margins of ethnography is to imagine together of new genres and forms of writing which create possibilities for newer kinds of questions and, new, and newer ways of representations to emerge. Thank you. Thank you so much, Devika. Such a wonderful presentation, so lucid, uh, and uh, love the narrative tone that your presentation had uh, all throughout. Uh, the, the geographical boundaries that you mentioned and the relationship of the body with really those boundaries was something very intriguing. And, um, you know, I was wondering about the rearticulation that uh, a body has to, uh, has to undergo uh, as it, you know, relearns the relationship with the physical spaces, which are a part of the quotidian expression. Or, uh, you know, once you're a part of the, uh, the daily field work, how it becomes unusual, unique, and new to a large extent, as you know, one is affected by uh, forces like the, the, the COVID virus, uh, the, the coronavirus. Okay, so I just have one question uh, with regard to this. Uh, Again, speaking from the perspective of how the spaces have changed and how many of us, including me, had to move our field work to a digital space. So uh, my question to you is, how has the multi-sensorial experience of ethnography adjusted itself in the digital space of exchange, wherein the audiovisual sensibility takes precedence over all other possible affective relationships? That an, that an ethnographer may have with their field work. You know, because you talked about interacting with uh, the people that you were uh, interviewing, you were talking to and the exchange of the samosa and the distance and the moving of the chairs in the library, uh, the digital space allows us a different kind of a freedom and compels us to have a different kind of a multi-sensorial expression. So your thoughts on this, please. Yeah, um, yeah uh, during the pandemic, um, if I understood your question, let me respond the way I have understood your question. Um, uh, I mean, there was a tremendous pressure also, um, you know, and the fact that, you know, we had just come out of Jamia protest. I don't want to forget that as well. Um, uh, so gradually we were trying to understand what was happening, you know, protest as well as, you know, what was happening by the state and the COVID thing. Um, so there was tremendous press pressure. And then, you know, there was a lot of uh, visuals that were coming on the screen as well on TV, uh, right? Um, so, uh, what I tried to do, you know, and I was constantly thinking about my uh, field, so uh, as it were, you know, and uh, so so my field also was being constructed through different uh, uh, media. So which means, you know, they were also uh, giving out. Uh, 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 so they they started with uh, you know WhatsApp uh, uh, channel, uh, which was called Dunya Sabki, and uh, so I was getting information on that as well so my field was also being created through those uh, forums or uh, let's say you know uh, some literature festival and uh, I, I saw some uh, presentations done by them as well so so my field although distant was being constructed even while I was at home through media uh, different modes um, but at the same time you know I was very uncomfortable so I tried uh, you know to connect through um, zoom and you know other ways uh, so i uh, so so uh, let me talk about one program that i tried to be part of uh, which was um, digitally uh, which was on zoom and uh, which was a book club but i can i mean i i can just tell you the fact that you know the the silence that it produces uh, you know, when uh, when a, a text like Sultana's Dream is being discussed with, uh, let's say, youth, um, probably between 15 and 21, 22, uh, it's, it's eerie. That silence uh, I felt was eerie and I have yet not gone back to those three or four sessions of almost one and a half, two hours sessions, which, I, which means I have around seven to eight hours of recording. And... Uh, 
the, those silences, you know, and 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 because we are talking of um, children and youth who are coming from a certain you know um, homes where, where there is no silence, you know, where there is you know a lot of work. Even today, although I I I'm from I uh, stay in an apartment, you know, there was construction going on, so you know I had to choose rooms, and you know. Um, where should I locate myself? And thankfully, when my turn came, the construction work stopped. Uh, so, you know, these silences, what does those silences mean? Uh, so digitally, you know, I didn't get us, I mean, it has to be understood in a, I think it's a, it's a much more difficult, uh, at least for me, it was a, it is a much more difficult, uh, uh, I, I think in that interpretation has to be done in a very, different way it can't be understood i think in the way we understand the you know the face to face in contact which is a little more easier even though you know i mean when you just close your um, face with a mask i think i couldn't hear you know i could see but i couldn't hear so i i wondered you know what is this visual which is not allowing me the auditory you know senses to function so um, so there were so many things you know that did not allow me, even when I was there, it did not allow me to participate, um, you know, in, in the most uh, human uh, way. And those regiments were not stated, you know. So, um, yeah, let me stop at that question. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Devika. Uh, we'll allow Zainab to take over from here. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, very original presentation, Devika. An alternative title could be uh, Researching in the Time of Corona, Ala Love in the Time of Cholera by Martins. Yes, yes. I, was, I had also uh, titled my chapter, but then, you know, I had a conversation with some of my professors and they said that it may not be a suitable title for, of course, they gave me a reason for that. But yes, I did think of that title. Okay. Uh, I understood from your paper that uh, COVID uh, sort of disabled you to function the way you wanted to function to collect your data. Uh, however, at the same time, it also afforded you new means uh, born out of COVID protocols uh, to research your field. Uh, was there something you incorporated out of your own free will? that stood outside the boundaries of these protocols or was not shaped directly by the protocols but would not have been uh, thought of if not for the pandemic and the restrictions that came with it oh absolutely there were so many things you know um, so so uh, my my work is on reading you know I, and i'm a student of education so um, and it's a very straightforward sort of uh, you know ethnography on reading you ask certain questions you look at children and you you know read uh, literature related to reading but one of the things that i had never thought of was look at, looking at uh, auto um, looking at ethno uh, sorry looking at autobiographies of um, you know women and uh, dalits uh, and and trying to locate trying to understand from those narratives what are they talking of you know where, where are they um, you know how are they talking about their uh, you know uh, you know uh, interaction with books, with literature, with libraries, with, um, you know, that, that literacy itself, you know, how are they talking about it? I think had this pandemic not happened, I would not have ever thought of, you know, um, even, you know, so how are, how are these uh, children or, who have grown up a little now, uh, they are in class 11, 12, or probably even in college, you know, how are they remembering those things? And, and strikingly, there, there is some sort of continuity in the way they are thinking and, you know, in the, ethnog in the autobiographies of, you know, um, uh, Siddha Lingaya or um, uh, in, uh, in so many, so many, I, now I completely, you know, maybe because of right now, I have not been able to uh, remember the names, but I can tell you there are, uh, you know, so this was really an opportunity that I thought was, uh, I mean, it's not an opportunity, but then for me, you know, I think this waiting itself also provided me the fact that, you know, look around, look at other things. Maybe there is, which, uh, you know, so do, do, um, do with the minimum things that are possible, you know. Uh, maybe, you know, what ethnographers, I feel, you know, they collect a lot of things, uh, thinking that, you know, we need more, we need more, right? And that is also a greed, and, and it's so capitalistic, right? 
uh, in the globalized world we we want to consume and and i i think what i also learned uh, in this period of waiting was that you know do with the minimum and see what can happen you know in your research thank you devika uh, so suman we don't have uh, questions uh, in the okay so we have a comment uh, by perhaps address in the chat box we're running short of time now there are two questions if yeah uh, one is a suggestion by uh, j bomb who is going to give us uh, who, yeah, who is going to deliver that. the yeah then am i audible then yeah, yeah. that is professor james bomblin he is a validator okay okay. Huh? okay okay so uh, let me read his question uh, daniel defoe's early novel journal of a plague year 1722 describes a process of isolation that leads to the destruction of language in silence as the plague recedes language is restored it's a comment right and we have a question by fazan uh, to uh, you can respond uh, the chat box okay over to you suman thank you zena thank you devika and thank you professor james bomb bomblin for joining us uh, and and thank you for agreeing to give us a valedictory keynote address uh, professor bomblin if you would allow us we have just one more presenter for this session uh, we would like to proceed with uh, that presentation and then we are really really eager to hear your keynote address professor thank you thank you so much uh so now we have the last presentation for today uh this is by steven s george he is a phd scholar of the department of english jamia millia islamia and also one of the organizers of this very engaging conference uh his paper is titled digital theater the personal is political over to you steven um thank you so much uh, suman so my title is digital theater the personal is political I'll start with something that Professor Bomblin has written in his uh, comment in the chat box that he describes a process of isolation that leads to the destruction of language in silence. So what I really am doing at this point is discussing about what kind of a language is being created through digital theater during the pandemics. So James Shapiro in his book The Ear of Lear Shakespeare in 1606 highlights the subtle subjectivity of a plague as it fails to make a significant mark in literature. He writes, "The paucity of evidence leaves unanswered crucial questions about what it was like to live through the plague. There are examples of ringing bells in churches, talking of death as in, as the final condition, and the messenger's delay in reaching Juliet as he was quarantined." in shakespeare's play but the plague never directly appears in his plays i am glad people in the global south in particular from india were articulately creating digital theater performances to talk about and around the ongoing pandemic so i'll be discussing four performances in my uh, presentation today which is which are allegedly by malika taneja the last poet by amitesh grover and written by sara mariam the lonely hearts club by anuja ghoshalkar and no country for women by el pueblo theater group all of these performances had come out in the year 2020 and 2021 in the middle of the pandemic when it was the first as well as the second wave of uh, and the covid virus that was going on in the country so before starting off in analyzing and discussing about these plays i want to start by talking about a point of the criticism of theater criticism most often we see that theater criticism is reduced to a textual analysis of a particular play now one needs to understand the difference between a collaborative art form versus an individual art form for example in a novel you could write about the particular aspects of a novelist and how he is thinking or how they are thinking that is a very different component but in collaborative art forms like theater and film there are multiple roles being played so when you are analyzing a particular event act or text one has to be quite specific about what is the real point of contestation over there is it the direction 
is it the screenplay is it the script and is it the scenography is it the design cinem cinematography so and in within these realms also there are multiple syntaxes visual grammar and different kind types of languages that exist that one needs to analyze and most often it is reduced to a textual analysis which is also a good practice but that cannot contain the entirety of what the final product is uh, whether it is a film or a theater so now what really is theater when we talk about theater in, in india we come from a very traditional sense of a historical understanding of bharat uh, muni's natya shastra so we already have an existing you know tradition of theater so even when we are mentioning traditional theater there is this western traditional theater which is there as well as the indian traditional theater then we see new modernist theater brits epic theater and different kind of theaters that have emerged in the uh, last 100 years as well as historically which has existed there what is what i am discussing today is about post dramatic theater let us first understand the theater researcher hans thies uh, lehmann in his book when he says post dramatic theater is talking about certain tendencies and stylistic traits occurring in avant garde theater since the end of the 1960s so lehmann locates what he calls the new theater as part of simultaneous and multi perspectival form of perceiving what really is theater so in this avant gardeness there is an experimental sense of what really theater is and reimagining of theater and when he says it is a post dramatic he means it is an extension of the drama not an end of drama and uh, extinguishing of drama but an extension of drama now so this was so most of the when i uh, four of these performances which i am going to discuss today are located within the realm of post dramatic theater now let's talk about another thing which is extremely pertinent to theater which is scenography something that is very less uh, which has been given very less importance so pa pamela howard states in her book what is scenography scenography is the seamless synthesis of space text research art actors directors and spectators that contribute to an original creation jocelyn mckinney and philip butterworth expand upon this uh, to suggest that scenography is not simply concerned with creating and presenting images to an audience it is concerned with audience reception and engagement it is a sensory as well as an intellectual experience emotional as well as rational scenography is about creating a live and active theater experience creating a somatic and sensory experience otherwise one can see a popularized trend of large sets that are designed which are completely dead or inactive spaces in our lives are not dead but always active and i think it's important in a performance to activate the kind of scene sets that they are using and from this i move on to the idea of a digital scenography so what these plays have done in terms of a digital realm of scenography so my title states that the personal is political now this paper the personal is political is by femin uh, by feminist activist carol hanis which was originally published in the year 1969 there are multiple interpretations of this slogan and it has its own journey in this last almost 50 years it has its own journey but the main idea remains that apart from the realm of the public the political which is seen uh, which is always seen as an external there is an internal component to the lives and bodies of women as well as other genders so focusing on that particular point is very important and when i you know analyze these uh, the journey of these theater performances i uh, what is also interpreted as the personal is political is the private is political so these plays are extremely private as well as intimate and those are the kind of discussions that are that i am going to bring in now the first play 
is allegedly by Malika Taneja. Now, it is the only play which had its own life before the pandemic as well. So they did a physical uh, play of it in which, so, be, so the basic component is that two women are discussing about an event in the past and they are coming to a point of resolution if the act was violation or not. And that is the basic discussion which was there in the physical realm. It mostly revolves around the question of consent. It sparks multiple conversations around the subject of sexual violence, consent, gender justice, and everyday discrimination faced by women. It is very interesting that they call it as a work forever in progress. It opens up the contradictions, confusions, and irregularities of our own behaviors and solidarities. So when they transformed this play to a digital performance, what they did is they were doing this on Zoom. And when they were using the Zoom platform, apart from these two uh, people who are conversing with each other, there are multiple people in the background who do not emerge during their performance, uh, during their conversation. But the moment they are stopping, they bring in a different kind of energy and vibe to the entire performance space by discussing everyday evocative ideas and things which are extremely casual in nature. And they are the one who are actually responding to their questions of, for example, uh, with a very, they have very simple questions like, are we safe on the street? Something like that. So they will respond with the uh, answer yes or no. And these kind of things are then uh, brought out to the audience as well. So Zoom audience participates in it through the Zoom Interpol in which they are also participating in the performance. And after the performance, there are discussions also that go on, which actually during the pandemic opens up a collective experience of sharing and talking with each other in isolation. Now, the second play that I want to talk about is The Last Poet by Sara, uh, by Amitesh Grover, and it was written by our fellow scholar, Sara Mariam. What interests me is that they call it a multi-layered art form with theater, creative coding, digital scenography, film, and live, live performance. It is, they call it India's first genre bending broadcast of theater on the internet. Now, in this performance, there are several characters who are talking about a poet who used to live in the neighborhood. It is very interesting the kind of scenography that they have created in which they are bringing the digital and theater to a level where they both intersect and create an identity of its own that is immersive, innovative, and inquisitive. It feels like a digital art exhibition because we open up a website, then we are entering into a particular space. There is this experience of going into a digital web space where you enter rooms, which are not the real one, but digital ones. So at one point, there are several rooms that are there and we choose to be in one of the rooms and we can't decide which room it is. There are six rooms. So it is very interesting that everyone who is viewing the performance is not actually seeing the uh, same performance. They are all seeing different things at the same time. And then we can come out of the room as well and then go to another room. And all these live performances are being done at from their own homes. So every performer is at a different space at their own homes, similar to what was there in allegedly as well. So. People are not in one space. So this is also a different kind of ex uh, experience that is created through the idea of an exhibition. So in these fragments, the viewer makes a narrative of their own, of what's going on. It's not the director or writer who is telling that this is the story. The audience themselves have to create what the story is really about. One is able to grasp the overarching idea that runs through the rooms, which is about the poet, poetry, both as an idea and as a fact. So in fact, when I was watching this play, I was not able to enter all the rooms. I was only able to go to four or five rooms and see. And that is what I have grasped at best. Now, these dialogues were very colloquial and crisp. 
It attempts to communicate several issues of the contemporary times and blissfully communicating the one central concern of a danger that we are submerged and living in. The transition, the change of clothes, the visual language created by the actors on screen all run smoothly hand in hand with the content. This is one of those artworks which has a dynamic experiment with content, form and the medium and all of them functioning in rhythm and tranquility with each other. The next play that I'm going to talk about is The Lonely Hearts Club by Anuja Ghoshalkar and her group, The Drama Queen. Again, I'll talk with something that they themselves describe about the play. It features the intimate lives of nine amazing participants, many of whom turned performers for the very first time with this production. Through devised erotica text based on their own experiences, our performers challenge the viewer to question their idea of desire, attraction, vulnerability, and our interaction with the internet in all its vastness. The performance will be intercut with the opportunity for a question answer and for viewers to share their own experiences. Now, in this, it you know takes on to a different level in which during the performance, this they are interacting with the audience. So they will, during the Zoom performances, these all people are in different spaces and they are interacting with the people during the performances. And these nine intimate party, nine, nine participants whose intimate lives we are talking about, this actually started as a small Instagram page or a WhatsApp group in which people were there to just share what they were feeling during the pandemic. Eventually, this Instagram and these conversations turned up uh, to a performance they created, which so they titled it as the Lonely Hearts Club, which they called for their own conversation during isolation during the pandemic. So now, and in fact, some of these performances are like, they feel almost like Instagram reels. Some feel like we uh, video calls, some are kept, uh, some keep camera at a distance. Now, the interesting part is it's not just trendy, quirky to do, keep the camera there, keep the camera at a close end. Every single bit of this is very well thought and is actually questioning the idea of distance, intimacy through the camera as well. So they see the camera as a potent medium of exchange at the same time. The way this performance reimagines the concept of touch, loneliness, distance, pandemic, isolation, it makes an intervention to the desolated experience of the pandemic. So there will be a point in which they'll stop and they'll say, let's interact with the audience. And they are not afraid to do so. Already the digital realm is so uh, sometimes threatening for the queer people. But in that, they are reliving and reimagining th those spaces with, you know, re-establishing their own positions at those points. So they'll just stop the video and ask, when were you last naked? And if somebody feels like saying something to this, they'll go on and say. So these small evocative ideas, how they bridge a connection between the performer and the audience. And ultimately, again, it's not a particular you know linear script that is working but it are these are multiple fragments and every time the experience so i have uh you know viewed this performance twice and every time the experience is extremely different because suman how much time do i have five, five minutes. minutes all right thanks thanks five is a lot <laughs> so so basically the ships so the performance sails through the fluid waters of erotica love lust this is rare, rare and trailblazing. I mean, the scenography unsettles the conventional paradigm of a linear narrative and narrates the story through dialogue, square visual language, and vibrant reimagination of space. So these fragmented narrative express profound comprehensive tales that were created during the pandemic and the audience take forward in their thoughts and imagination. <clears throat> Now, the last play that I want to discuss is No Country for Women uh, by El Pueblo Theatre. Now, an interesting fact about this play is that it is me who has written and directed this play as well. Um, so now it's again interesting what they call 
for themselves and interactive intermedia performance on zoom which explores the experience of pandemic induced lockdown from a gender perspective again and again why i want to say what they say about themselves is because i want to highlight a particular fact towards the end which is they do not have a synopsis of which says ki this is the which says this is the particular story that is being followed they are again and again for you know focusing they as in the four groups or uh, these digital performances are <clears throat> focusing on the fact that this is an experience this is a digitally curated scenographic experience for the viewer as well as the performer then it goes on to say it deals with the themes of migration refugees sexuality violence marginalization but at no point it says what it is actually about which is that it is the story of two women roma and julie who are lovers and separated du during the pandemic one one is subjected to the dangers on the street and the other is unsafe at home through this perplexing saga it intends to deal with the multiple themes and now in this play what el pueblo has tried to do is you know recreate certain when uh, you know uh, suman i'll have two minutes just let me know or even one minute for that matter so what they are doing they are using masks so the covid mask that we are wearing in everyday life they are using that to create a certain visual language they are using the idea of a traditional mask of the theater to create the sensorium idea of the theater these are shifting ideas that are being brought from theater the digital as well as the reality that we were all living in the covid pandemic my my focus here i mean the idea of, of this per, uh, session was to personalizing the pandemic in which i am also talking about my own play for that matter but more than my own play i would like to highlight one fact uh, factor here is that the journey of theatrical performance uh, production and the focus of scenography in it because when these performances are using zoom as a platform or a website as a platform it is not only the yeah one minute great and just concluding so these are mediums in which they are doing scenographic interventions and intimacy is being used as a composite integral component of what is called as performance and every single all of these performances i like all of them i mean they are all feminist interventions in the times of pandemic and using these components of intimacy they create a new queer visual language of a theatrical production thank you thank you so much steven that was a wonderful presentation uh, i particularly like the the point from which you started the paper about the internal view of the personal and the private and that's a point that i would like to circle back to uh, you know once i have the question in place for you but before that i would also like to comment on you know the play allegedly that you mentioned uh, where you talked about the possibility of viewing multiple or rather varied performances at the same time uh, which i believe because you started your paper also with the thought that you know it's the criticism of the individual uh, versus the criticism of the collective that is uh, you know that that has constructed a piece of art so we have the novel or any singular performance that uh, where an individual can be critiqued as opposed to these performances where a collective contribution and and the critique depends on how you are looking at the collective contribution uh, so i was really intrigued by the work allegedly that you mentioned where you also talked uh, i was wondering if the viewer of the story who is also the story maker because each of them are entering through a different door uh, how that also problematizes the question of critiquing the collective because the the viewer is also you know a part of the critique then you know and do they also come under that uh, uh, radar of the critique that they are perhaps subjecting uh, to the uh, to the story makers you know but the question uh, that i had with regard to your uh, work is like i said i'll circle back to the private and the pers and the personal you know because uh, the works that you've taken in your paper uh, they concern themselves with both the personal and the private matters uh, which are not often uh, publicly staged and if at all uh, the proscenium is also rather an objective space to some extent a neutral space 
because it is detached from the place of the origin of that act, right? So I was wondering about, uh, uh, you know, the presence of the camera, which is inside one's personal space and also the private space. How does the gaze of the camera then exceed the, you know, because you've used the terms, it's an immersive and inquisitive gaze. Do you think it also exceeds that limit? And does it also enter the space of being invasive to some extent? And uh, my question also comes from the point that, you know, many a times when these artists are constructing a digital, uh, 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 you know, work on a digital format, there are other people also present, you know, there are family members present, or there are uh, objects of these people present, right? So how does the camera then become an invasive case then? So, yeah. Um, brilliant, Suman. Uh, just the other day, three days back, we were talking about the uh, digital performances and today I'm presenting one in your uh, session that you are chairing. So it's incredible. Thanks for giving me an opportunity to talk about the gaze, you know, in no country for women, you know, how it actually begins. It begins with a woman coming into the room. There is a laptop which is there through which the webcam is on and suddenly she sees that the camera is on. So she actually questions this inquisitive gaze, the camera be following us, you know, we take cameras to uh, our bathrooms and to other places. And most of the time it's snooping into our through uh, Siri, Alexa, whatnot. So the microphone, so, and the camera. So what if it's all being surveilled at the all times? So that is the inquisitive gaze that is being questioned in this. Uh, so no country for women actually questions that and begins with that. And the play that you're talking about, it's not allegedly, it's actually the last poet in which we uh, enter to uh, multiple rooms, but it's very interesting that I would like to bring in a point from allegedly that when these people are doing this performance, for example, right now I'm at my home. So there might be somebody who's in the kitchen. Somebody might be in the bathroom. There might be a ringing bell as well the internet might go off or so many multiple threads are there but other than that you know what these women are saying uh, in allegedly so sometimes they are prompting this particular word bra panty now it, it itself in an indian society you know indian household it's so so provocative in certain senses so it's so and many of these performers were first time performers who actually tried it during the pandemic and they also so so that answers your question also, how, you know, multiple gazes actually exist inside the home also. And when you talk about the proscenium as an objective space, that is very correct. You know, now, where does the life of a theater production actually ends or actually continue? So No Country for Women was actually then adapted into a physical spaces as well. And it was performed in Gotha Institute very recently in July. And similarly, allegedly is being performed in Ashoka University through and with and it's in collaboration with architecture students over there. So you see, so the idea is about the particular journey of creating these kind of, uh, you know, theatrical productions, which have very extremely immersive visual scenography. So then that was my answer to you. Suma. Thank you so much, Stephen. Uh, Zena, would you like to take over? Yeah, uh, kudos, Stephen, for uh, producing, writing, directing <laughs> a play during the pandemic. Uh, so my question was, uh, uh, did the availability of uh, digital theater reconfigure the way live theater or physical theater is consumed, especially post lockdown? You know, um, that's that's something very incredible that you've asked, and I would have covered that as well. That actually, do we actually look up to it as a medium that we would like to follow in future? Because as practitioners, it matters a lot that how much actually we rely on this medium. You know, so mostly these performances were never thought of, or we we would have never thought about these kind of performances. And in fact, James Shapiro mentions this with Shakespeare as well. The time he spent at his home during the lockdown were that were the times when he wrote many of his plays when he was going through grief and so much of these times so similarly we were also you know articulating what is going around in the society at the same time we were also thinking it through and we were also not con nobody was confident about it no performer who created these performances on zoom was i mean extremely confident about it because it was ex extremely experimental in that nature so but now most of the people have moved on to physical spaces and i don't think anybody who has done these plays is still practicing it on a uh, zoom platform although they did i mean until 2022 may my i myself have done that so uh, if given an opportunity one would do it again but 
thinking of it as the primary pertinent instrument or a medium to practice the theatrical production maybe not or maybe it will be you know mostly it's more about the journey than the uh, specifics of a particular medium that's my thank you so uh, we have a question from Fezan. A uh, very interesting presentation, Stephen. You mentioned that there was an attempt to bridge performer and audience in the plays you studied. But do you think engagement of audience in a theater really turns them into performers? For example, in the theater of oppressed, audiences tend to become actor, actors in some sense, but they do not seem to do away with the category of audience. You know, um, there is this uh, particular, you know, I just use this uh word just a second in which i say that just a second so scenography is the seamless synthesis of space text research art directors and spectators that contribute to an original creation so the idea is not exactly that the audience became becomes an uh becomes an actor because actor is a specific role because there is a specific attribute to it what here is that they become an active participant. They are always an active participant when even a viewing is an active participation. But this active participation is also in terms of their own sensory experiences that they create. So in this way, when scenography, the spectators all spectator also contributes to an original creation. So that is the engagement and the role of the audience. And when you mention theater of the oppressed, as well as when we talk about, you know, the third space in terms of Brech also. I mean, these are traditions that definitely all people who are practicing post-dramatic theatre are actually doing, uh, are actually, you know, very inclined towards. So that is also the idea, you know, to make that kind of connect with the audience, not seeing them as two different uh, entities, the performers, the actors. So there is a hierarchization that happens also when we see. But when it's a creation in which everyone contributes, the hierarchization, you know, I will not say it completely, you know, disappears, but it kind of becomes a bit lower. Even the director, scenographer, uh, script writer, they all, you know, they lessen the kind of, uh, uh, the kind of hierarchization that exists. So in a play that was performed very recently uh, by uh, Abhilash Pillai. So in that, uh, uh, in the end, there were a lot of me, uh, digital instruments that they used to do a physical uh, performance. So in that they clapped for those digital mediums that were being used, for example, the projectors, the sound system and all and various things. So that is also interesting that you gave that object and prop a life of their own and they you are acknowledging the fact that they are extremely integral to your performance as well as to the creation. So that's my answer to Fezan. Thanks. Uh, so when do we have time for another question? Yeah, just about two minutes, perhaps. Okay, so Zeba has a question. Uh, very impressive presentation, George. How the digital theater is different from Bertolt Brecht's concept of epic theater that also aimed at establishing connection between audiences and actors? You know, really, I mean, uh, it's not that it is different from uh, Brecht. Brecht. I mean, Brecht has an uh, uh, idea of an epic theater in which we'll say one thing that the first element which is being removed is the idea of a traditional catharsis, the idea of an emotional extent excess that creates. Secondly, the idea of spectacle is also reduced in Brecht's theater. Brecht doesn't, uh, you know, uh, tend or try to imitate and create large uh, visual scenography or something or sets or designs. He says that we can definitely, you know, de destabilize that. And when, you know, uh, so more than different, it actually inclines with what happens with digital theater. I don't think there is much, you know, uh, philosophizing that has happened with digital theater, but definitely in terms of digital theater, the idea is, uh, again, you can't create a catharsis moment unless because there is you know when it's a live performance what if the internet goes off for the audience or for the performer where where does the catharsis come in so that is destabilized in terms of the large sets you know people are literally performing from their own small spaces so from uh, so people were performing also from hostels in which three people are living in one particular hostel so one is taking a small corner putting up a tent kind of a situation and doing the play so there is no idea of that then the audience interaction extremely pertinent to all of these plays except for um uh, uh, 
the last poet in which also there is this feedback and uh, idea which was there but not direct conversations but direct conversations was there so actually it is very much inclined towards brech and i think uh, brech and theater of the oppressed are uh, one of very you know inspiring uh, books and which uh, we ourselves look up to when we create theater theatrical productions yeah thanks uh, zeba for that question Thank you, Zainab, uh, and thank you, Stephen. A uh, wonderful presentation. And thank you, everyone, for these very thought-provoking uh, presentations, for sharing personal accounts of the pandemic experience, and for, most importantly, patiently addressing all the questions that were coming in the chat box and from Zainab and from me. And since uh, I've already shared my comments on each of the presentations, uh, please allow me to conclude the session now. I would however request everyone to stay tuned in with us as we have Professor James Bomlin, who has very kindly agreed to deliver the valedictory keynote address. And even though we come to the end of the two-day conference with this session, we have the valedictory uh, address coming up. So uh, we're all looking forward to it, Professor Bomlin. So I would request everyone to stay tuned in. And uh, the organizers, if you would like to please take over from here. Thank you. I mean, it's my complete privilege that you listen to my presentation. I don't know how many mistakes I've made in front of a person who has written so largely about Shakespeare and theater. <laughs> <laughs>